morning, everyone. Welcome to Prairie Presbyterian Church. It's good to see you all, and uh, welcome to those of you joining at home. We acknowledge that we're gathered on Treaty 1 land, first entrusted by Creator God to the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, the homeland of the Red River Métis. Today we celebrate the uh, coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and we're going to look at that story uh, from the book of Acts. Um, but as our call to worship today, I wanted to read to you these words from Psalm 143, verses 8 to 10. Let me hear of your steadfast love in the morning, for in you I put my trust. Teach me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Save me, O Lord, from my enemies. I have fled to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on a level path. Let's start by singing together uh, our opening songs.
shows us the Father and sings his dream over his sons and daughters. The Holy Spirit comes and shows us the Son, breathes his mercy over tells us that the Spirit of God prays for us with sighs too deep for words. Through the life-giving breath of God, we are given all that we need. And so this morning, this is a prayer of confession that's more of a centering prayer. And as I always say, this may resonate with you or it may not, this is a type of prayer that resonates very deeply with me. And so let us Breathe deeply this morning, inhaling the good gifts that God provides and ex exhaling all the things that we need to confess and to release. Let us pray. God, Son, Spirit, this morning, let us breathe in your strength and let us exhale all of our exhaustion. Let us breathe in freedom and let us exhale all that holds us back. Let us breathe in a new sense of direction and let us exhale the paths we no longer want to use. Let us breathe in hope and let us exhale self-doubt. Let us breathe in your unconditional love for us. 
and let us exhale all of our distrust and hate. Holy Spirit, let the mighty rush of your presence in this place blow away all of our fears and worries and help us to breathe in your gifts of life anew. Amen. The God of wind and rain, the God of creation, is a God of mercy. God is quick to forgive, and God's promise of restoration is for all people. Know today that you are forgiven and be at peace. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I invite you to share a sign of peace with those around you, whether it's by waving at those in the building here where I am, by sharing a sign of peace with those around you in your home, adding to the YouTube chat, or messaging someone you care about. Uh, just a couple of things to announce today. Um, first is uh, that the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Canada meets this week, starting at uh, 1 o'clock today. And um, you can watch it online. I know you're all going to be glued to YouTube to watch uh, the proceedings go on for General Assembly. Uh, it goes through till Wednesday evening. Um, I'm a commissioner this year, so I have to be there. But it's a virtual one again um, so basically, it's at least five hours of Zoom per day for me for the next few days. Um, but I would just like to ask for your prayers for the General Assembly as they meet, and particularly as uh, I think there's about 350 people that will meet online for this. Um, so pray for the technology all to work and people to be able to use it well um, to make uh, good decisions about the life of our national church and denomination. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention this morning was that uh, the elders met earlier this week, and uh, one of the things that we talked about, we talked about some summer plans, um, kind of late in August we're going to end up having a barbecue and hopefully get people together and, uh, and join together in that. I have some time off in uh, July, so I won't be around for a little bit, um, and uh, we have some ideas for the summer of what that's going to look like, both for online content and also for gathering in this space. And you're always welcome. We'd love to have people join us here on Sunday mornings. Um, but also another thing that we talked about was Sunday school. And we just haven't had Sunday school in now over two years. And we realistically, we know Sunday school is, we're not going to start Sunday school next week in June. Like, that's not going to happen. Often we were closing Sunday school kind of by now. Um, but we hope where our plan is to start Sunday school in the fall. And so we need to start planning now for that. And one way we're going to do that is to have a Sunday school ideas session. And this is really for anyone, uh, particularly for parents, if you have ideas or sort of opinions on how you think Sunday school should work in the fall, things like how often we should have it, whether every Sunday or every few weeks, um, the format, uh, and, and even just ideas for creative things we can do, how we can do Sunday school really well for our kids. Um, but also, not just for parents, but if you're interested in serving or helping or leading in Sunday school, or even if you just think, I have a great idea, I don't know if I want to do it, um, but I'm happy to pass it on, then come to the ideas session that we're going to have. So that ideas session is going to be on, on Wednesday evening, June 22nd at 7 p.m. So we're going to meet here at the church, but we'll also provide you with a Zoom link if, uh, if you can't come in person or are, are more comfortable staying at home, that's, that's fine. Just let me know that you want to come. Actually, either way, let me know if you're coming, whether it's in person or online. Uh, send me an email, or you can also email Bonnie Zimmer. Uh, her email and my email address are in the church email that got sent out this morning. So you can contact either of us just to let us know you're going to come, because um, we want to have a decent group, decent-sized group, to generate some good ideas for what we're going to do in the fall, and then start to try to build what kind of leadership team we need uh, over the summer months. Um, so we're really excited about that and are looking forward to that. I will also mention if there's, I noticed we don't have any kids here in the space this morning, um, but if you are watching this and you're a parent of very young children, our nursery continues to be open as well uh, every Sunday. So you're welcome to come and participate in the service as much as you like. And anytime you need to take your kids out, you can go downstairs. So if you're watching this 
and chomping at the bit for Sunday school to happen. You can also come when there isn't Sunday school. <laughs> We're happy to have you. Um, let's uh, sing together again, and you'll notice uh, um, the Holy Spirit often takes care of our music and our themes in a way. Uh, today we picked our music based on Pentecost, which is obviously going to be about uh, Holy Spirit. Um, but this prayer, is, uh, this song actually, um, which is a prayer, really connects with the prayer that Aaron just prayed, um, which often happens without us planning or talking about that. Um, but let's uh, sing together, O Breath of Life, Come Sweeping Through Us. reading this morning is Psalm 104. I will read the part of one. I invite you to join in with Aaron on the part of all. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide. Creeping things, innumerable are there, living things, both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan that you formed to sport in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in all these words. Who looks on the earth and it trembles. Who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to the Lord in whom I rejoice. This reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, 
If we, in fact, suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. This reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 22. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them with a tongue resting on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to each other, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, Standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving and faithful God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you can give us insight and understanding today by your Holy Spirit speaking in scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. I always think that um, like that's one of the best opening lines of a sermon ever. Uh, Day of Pentecost, Peter stands up to get everyone's attention first, and his opening line of his sermon is, these people aren't drunk, it's only nine in the morning. <laughs> that's a good... Uh, good opening line of a sermon right out of the Bible. Um, there's, uh, this story is bizarre. There's a strangeness to the spirit that the spirit shows up in, in these tongues of fire and this mighty wind and then this speech that pours out of people's mouths that are they're speaking in other languages and people understand uh, what they're speaking, the, the mighty deeds of God that they're uh, proclaiming in languages that they don't even know. Um, so they're speaking in the languages of the nations that are gathered. And um, I was thinking about this, about how um, if you're trying to communicate something to someone in another language that you don't speak, right, and how hard that is, right? You've had that experience of communicating with someone in another language and trying to get your point across. Like imagine if the spirit had not done this 
uh, how difficult it would have been going out into these nations and then making sure, oh, like, how do we find translators and, and try to figure out how do, we, how do we do this? But they hear God's uh, proclamation in their native tongue and how much easier that is. Even when you have translation, um, it's better when you hear it in your own language, right? Like, I speak some French, um, but... It's been a long time since I could speak French somewhat fluently. So now if I'm listening to French, I can pick up a word here or there, but it's, it's harder, right? Um, so how important was this that the Spirit did this on this day so that people could hear in their native language? I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about an experience that I had when I was in Poland. And um, I was there with, uh, on a trip with the University Singers a long time ago when I sang with the University Singers here at U of M. And we were billeted in people's homes for part of the trip. And we were in this one house, and they were, they were lovely. There was a couple of us from the choir there. And um, they, they were serving as a meal, and they put out soup for everyone. And, of course, when you're billeted with families, you're told you have to eat whatever's put in front of you, Right? And I, I'm less of a picky eater now, and I'm still a pretty picky eater. <laughs> so um, I look at the soup. I'm a little worried about what I'm seeing. Um, and I eat the soup. And I, oh, this is actually pretty, it's actually pretty good. So I say in English, this soup's really good. What is it? And one of the people that's staying with me can speak German. And so he translates in Ger from English to German and asks what the soup is in German. I don't speak German. The man of the family can speak German, but his wife and his daughters cannot speak German. They can only speak Polish. So he then translates into Polish, what is it? And then, because he doesn't know either. He's just eating it. And his wife then says something in Polish back to him, and he then translates it into German to the other person I'm with, and then that person translates it back into English, and it comes back, it's cow tongue soup. I, oh, okay. Well, I was almost done the bowl of soup by the time it had gone through all that translation. But it actually tasted pretty good, which was okay. So this story of languages and making it easy for people to understand, maybe think of that when it was hard to understand just about what kind of soup am I drinking. There's another story in the Bible that's about languages where people spoke all the same language and were able to accomplish great things because of that, but then God made it so that they couldn't understand each other anymore, confused their speech, gave them other languages to speak. And this story is in Genesis 11. I want to read it to you. This is the Tower of Babel story. Um, it's not a long story. It's pretty short. So I'm just going to read, read it to you right out of uh, Genesis. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel or Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. What's the problem why did God do that? What's the problem? The, the key is in the line when they say this. Let's make a city and a tower that goes to heaven and make a name for ourselves. Uh, and incidentally, if the whole world has one language, and 
I don't think the whole world is working on this project. It's just a group of people that is working on this project. But think of how making a name for yourself is actually an exclusionary type practice, right? Because if you're making a name for yourself, who are the people who are looking at you with envy at like, oh, look at what, wow, we know about them, right? Fame is actually an exclusionary kind of thing, right? There's a small subset of people who make a name for themselves, who are famous, and then everyone else is, oh, aren't you great? And actually, you see, that's only supposed to belong to God, right? The, oh, aren't you so great? The adoration that goes with celebrity, that only really is supposed to belong to God. And so God, in this instance, comes down and says, oh, wow, that communication that they have They've really managed to coordinate this project really well by overcoming, like by not having any language barrier. Let's create a thing called a language barrier. And then there's no way they're going to be able to do something like this. And we'll scatter them everywhere. So you see, this is Babel's problem. A city, they build a city, and they build a tower so that we can make a name for us. And God says, "Mm, wow, nothing's going to be impossible for them. We better confuse their speech. This communication that they have, it's the primary means of coordinating their projects that they can make a name for themselves. Now, we fast forward then to our story today, Pentecost, and actually we get a few things in this story that are um, what might be called the classic theophanies. That's a fancy word, theophany. It means an appearance of God. Okay, you might have heard like other words like epiphany or cacophony. Um, Theo is the prefix meaning God, like theology. This is theophany, the appearance of God. And we get some classic things that show up in the uh, Hebrew Bible quite a bit. Uh, A mighty wind that blows, that's a, a classic thing that shows up when it's God appearing in the Hebrew Bible. Fire right? The tongues of fire that come down. This is a classic feature of God showing up amongst God's people as fire coming down from heaven. You think of things like the burning bush or things like fire coming down in the story of Elijah. Um, Also fire showing up and and consuming offerings that were put on the altar that the fire just shows up out of nowhere. So wind and fire show up at Pentecost. And that's a cue for the readers and also for the people experiencing oh, this must be God. This isn't just random wind and random fire. This is God showing up. So you get classic features of theophany, of God's appearance. But Pentecost also has this feature of language, as we've said, that suddenly they can speak in all the different languages. And whereas God found out at Babel or or concluded at Babel Ooh, nothing is going to be impossible for them if they can communicate freely. Well, look what happens. God shows up and makes it possible for them to communicate freely because, why? Because nothing is impossible for God. The question now might be, what is being built at Pentecost? Whereas in in Babel, they were building a city and a tower. Now... Babel is kind of undone. Speech is no longer confused. It's freely spoken in all the languages. So what's being built? Is it our tower, our thing to make a name for us or for me? No, God's doing something else. God's incredible deeds are being proclaimed. God is the focus of what is being talked about, not the coordination of our great project that we're going to do to make a name for ourselves. It's actually about God's name being spread in the world. And there's a couple of interesting notes here. One is about uh, the city. This isn't necessarily the point of uh, the message today. But we notice that the people are building a city with a tower. And then like in Revelation, God brings a city from heaven and just gifts it to the people, right? Where... The city to make a name for ourselves is an exclusionary practice of look at those people who aren't part of our city, whereas the city that comes down from heaven in Revelation is an inclusionary practice where the gates are always open for people to come in and go out. Anyone is welcome to join in God's city, where God is at the center rather than putting human 
uh, ingenuity at the center. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, you notice as well that instead of God making it so that everyone has the same language again, just resetting it back to the way it was before, God actually makes it so that all of the disciples are speaking in the multiple languages. So it's as though God is saying, well, I confused your speech before, but what happens through language is cultures are developed and peoples are developed and traditions are developed because we all speak different languages and we're all from different places. So in this act, God is actually not saying, well, let's just all go back to the one thing and we'll all be uniform. God is saying and respecting the diversity of the languages that have been around. So yes, there's one message and there's one God and we all have unity, but there's not this uniformity. So he doesn't just undo everything and say, well, now it's just going to be one thing and we'll just all learn this one language. No, let's speak it in all the languages. Let's have diversity. It's fascinating that God does that. The other thing to notice here is that the communication that happens on the day of Pentecost the communication itself is not the engine of the building project that God is up to. Because God is up to a building project. God is building the church with this activity of Pentecost initially. But it's not a building project in the same way as the Tower of Babel, right? So God is building a people. And the communication that's done at Pentecost is actually not the engine the same way that, that at um, at Babel, the communication is the engine that drives the ability to be able to build the, the tower in the city. The communication is something different. The spirit of God is actually the engine of God's building project. The spirit itself is active in the world doing the actual building. The communication that's done at Pentecost and throughout, if you notice it in the book of Acts, the communication is often almost always is a means of witnessing to what God is doing in our midst. So instead of saying, we're going to coordinate and do this thing and we're going to talk about it and orchestrate it, it's, oh my goodness, look at what the Holy Spirit's doing. Oh, wow, the Holy Spirit has even been poured out on, the, on these people. Wow, how did that happen? The, the disciples are always catching up to what God is doing and then bearing witness to it and talking about it. It's exactly what happens here on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit shows up, and Peter stands up and says, oh, I better explain what's going on. <laughs> He's just witnessing to it. The communication is always witnessing to the activity of God. And this shouldn't be a surprise, because last week, when we talked about the ascension, Jesus, what did he say to his disciples? Wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He doesn't say, wait until the Holy Spirit comes and the Spirit will give you like a 10-step plan for how you're going to organize and coordinate this whole church building project and you're going to need to get yourself into teams and all those things. No. The Spirit's going to do a whole bunch of stuff. The church is going to be built and you will be my witnesses. You will bear witness to this and you'll tell people what's going on. You'll interpret for them maybe. I was thinking about the cow tongue soup <laughs> eight years and years ago. If I had tried to wait for the answer to my question before actually trying the soup, well, first, it, would have been, it probably would have gotten cold and it would have taken a long time. I would have been seen probably as impolite, all those things. But at the end of getting the answer to what this is and hearing this is cow tongue soup, I would have really tried to politely decline and see, so that's controlling the situation, right? I'm in control, I'm gonna control the situation. And instead, my speech, because I tried the soup, my speech was actually to express delight. And then finding out that it was cow tongue soup I got to express my surprise at my delight in the soup because I actually liked it. Now, if we extend that out to how we interact with God a lot of the time, 
God, please explain it to me. Please explain the steps. Please show us, can you show us like what needs to happen? Like I can't quite get the picture. If we think about something like our visioning process in the fall, it's a nebulous thing. God, if you could just give us like, what are the, what are the action steps or our own lives, the same thing? If you could just tell us, you know, just give us a little bit. Because, you know, if you just told me a little bit more, that way I can more easily raise my objections. Right? Because that's actually what we do. Right? It's not, please tell me a bit more so that I can more easily enter into it. I mean, most of the time, that's not why we're asking that question. We're asking it because it's like, well, there are like the three things I don't want to do. Maybe that's why God doesn't give us the whole picture. I don't know. I don't know. The reality is God doesn't give us the whole picture. And it's a challenge. It can be a challenge that God's spirit acts in strange ways a lot of the time. In non-intuitive ways, in surprising ways, through unexpected means and unexpected people. If God explained it beforehand, I bet most of the time we'd find a way to politely decline. And in fact, we do politely decline a lot of the time. So what do we do then? Well, we try not to politely decline. And when we do see God at work, we bear witness to God at work. And oh, do we have trouble with this? Because bearing witness is actually harder to do than having a project. Even when projects are hard and complicated, we all kind of like a good project it's easier to sort of follow through. And it's not that we shouldn't take on projects. Sure, let's take on projects. But for us, as followers of Jesus, God is always the center of those projects, right? At Babel, God was not the center of their project. But at Pentecost, the Spirit drives the project. God is at the center. Whatever larger thing we might take on, whatever missional initiative we might experiment with, it's always God's spirit that is the primary actor and activator. And as we see in the scriptures, there is a real surprise and strangeness to the activity of the spirit. So our job is to bear witness But is there anything else to do besides pointing to the Spirit's activity? Well, yeah, there's plenty of things to do. And there are some clues in our text. If you follow through the text, you you find at the beginning the thing, they, they are given a task to do by Jesus directly before the day of Pentecost actually happens. We get that same task sometimes too. Their task is, wait, I don't like that task, and lots of us don't. But you notice while they're waiting, an important thing is they are all gathered together. I mean, I wonder then if some of the disciples are thinking, well, come on, like, Jesus is risen, he's now ascended, like, shouldn't we be, like, let's get out there, let's start doing stuff. And did some of them say, well, no, he said, wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit. Like, I think it's not... He said it's not going to be that long. Did they have those arguments? They're gathered together thinking, well, is this really what we're supposed to be doing? Like I sometimes feel like that in the church, you're gathered together. Is this really what we're supposed to be doing? Waiting for the Spirit and then witnessing when the Spirit comes. So that's one task we can all do, gather together and wait. Then the Holy Spirit shows up in the story, right? Right? And Peter uh, is the one who stands up and is a spokesperson for the rest of the disciples and gives his sermon with his great opening line. uh, But the thrust of his sermon is actually this bearing witness activity. His main point is explaining, here's what you see. This is the Holy Spirit doing this, as in these people aren't drunk, they're speaking other languages that the Holy Spirit has given them. 
That's what's happening. His other main point in his, in his sermon is that he connects what everyone is seeing and experiencing to the death and resurrection of Jesus. So if you read on the rest of the, the sermon that he gives, you'll find that he does that connecting work. He points to Old Testament prophecy, and he also points to the fact that Jesus has died and is risen, and now he promised the giving of the Spirit, and that is what you see in here. So there's that connecting work that gets done. And often that's what preachers do or pastors do, is they try to help connect the dots. Then if you follow through to the rest of Acts, you get to the really uh, good stuff that's the meat of, well, what can we do? Uh, the very end of Acts chapter 2, verse 42. So this whole section closes off with this line. It's just talking about everybody who now has received the Spirit and, and, um, and, is, and is saying, yeah, okay, we're, we're with you. It simply says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So if we want something to do, there it is. It's not elaborate, is it? It's not elaborate. But this is the day-to-day the -day life of following Jesus, of being a disciple. Oh, the teaching. I'm learning. I'm learning something. To fellowship, being together with one another. That's been a specific challenge in the last couple of years. So whether that's here in person, in small groups, in, in one or two people gathered, however that is, fellowship. The breaking of bread. That might be communion, but it also might be eating together in a, in a more full form. And the prayers. They're praying regularly. These are some basic patterns of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And you find that we sometimes think, oh, shouldn't there be something more? Shouldn't there be some bigger thing that we're all about? Yeah, we'll do visioning processes and we'll do that in the fall. But actually, what we find here in this story and in the book of Acts generally is that the disciples continue to just come back to these practices learning, fellowship together, breaking of bread, and prayers. And any time they are moved to do something else, it's in the context of those things, the Spirit shows up and moves them out to do those things. So you'll find, I think I might have referenced this last week or the week before, um, that Paul, when Paul was first sent out as a missionary with the good news to go out and, and, and spread the good news, he didn't come up with that on his own initiative, and neither did the followers. They didn't come up with a strategic plan. We actually read the story, and it tells us there they were worshiping together and fasting and praying. And the Spirit said, appoint for me two of your leaders from amongst you that I will send out. And the Spirit names who they're going to be. It's really interesting, right? So it's when we're devoted to these basic practices of the Christian faith that that's when we... That's when the Spirit suddenly starts to do something. In our waiting and in our worshiping, in our prayers, the Spirit acts. And then we have the opportunity to bear witness to what the Spirit has done among us. It's fascinating how God works, right? It's never about our building project and our thing that we're going to do. It's always about what the Spirit is up to and how we can be attentive to the Spirit. I mean, in fact, maybe that's why these practices are given to us in the first place, because it's really hard to see what God is up to if we're spending no time in prayer, right? That's how we actually get attuned to what the Spirit is doing. So I encourage you this morning, sometimes the strangeness of the Spirit, especially when we read stories like this, we think, whoa, like, is that, is that what we're talking about? Is this what we're supposed to be doing? But you notice that the movement of this story is actually, yes, there's this big thing that God does, but look where it ends up. They devoted themselves to the teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers, right? Every day is not Pentecost. Every day is not the Spirit coming in with a mighty wind and tongues of fire on everyone. We do have some of those high moments in our lives. But the everyday practices is what the Spirit drives and then also enables the disciples to know what the Spirit is up to, to recognize what the Spirit is doing, and then also to not politely decline when the Spirit leads.
but instead to step into it so that we can experience even more of what the Spirit is up to in our lives. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing a song called Establish the Work of Our Hands. Um, it's a little bit of a tricky song to sing, um, so you can try to, to join in with us anyway. Um, and you might think uh, that, wow, that title sounds, and the song sounds really counter to what you just preached. Um, talks about establish the work of our hands. But there's a line in this, um, that's the chorus, but there's a line in the verse um, where it talks about, I know my life is passing away, but the works of your hands are what will remain. And then asking for the favor of the Lord to rest upon us. And uh, the whole verse, uh, opening verse, is actually about um, quoting, if you don't build it, we labor in vain. So really what this song is about, even though there's this repetition of establish the work of our hands, it's actually saying what we want is the work of our hands to actually be the work that you have established, like what you have done, the work that you are about, you are the builder, we want you to establish our hands in that work is basically what this song is saying. So let's uh, join together in singing this one. opportunity to remind us as we do each week about our stewardship that God has given us and uh, over each thing that we've been given and we're asked to give a portion of what we've been given back to the work of God and uh, we're deeply appreciative of each 
uh, person who gives to support Prairie, you can do so on our website, um, also through Pure Authorized Remittance, and usually uh, here in person. Um, we usually have a, a plate at the back. We don't have it today. Um, just uh, our treasurer, who's usually around, um, is not around today. But uh, um, also, if you are joining us, we know we still have uh, folks who are joining us from other faith communities as well. So we just encourage you to give to the faith community of which you're a part. Um, but we also know there's people on YouTube who've now claimed us as their faith community. So we're happy to have you as well. And we're, and we're thankful for the donations that you've sent our way. Uh, we really appreciate that. Aaron's going to lead us in a time of prayer. Let us pray. God of wind and flame, blow into our lives. Light the fire of hope, fan the flames of possibility. Transform us into a people who share your love with a world in pain. A people who proclaim your hope into a world given to despair. A people who live as though the world can be changed into the kingdom that is to come. Baptizing God, you speak to us in many languages over the course of our lives. The burbles and laughs and wails of infancy, the dis indistinct speech and partial words of toddlerhood, that strange syntax and slang of late childhood and adolescence, the full language of adulthood, the quavering speech and muted tones of old age. Speak to us in the language that we need to hear today. Hear us in the language that we speak. God of many languages, you sing the language of joy with us. You join us in the dance of life. Hear all your children who sing and dance and praise this morning. Those who celebrate new life with all the possibilities of the future. Those who celebrate relationships both the new and exciting, and the long-term, yet still exciting. Those for whom the wonder of life fills their being to the limit. May they hear your voice, joining in the singing and shouting. And yet, God of life, you also speak the languages of pain, of sorrow, of fear, of despair. Hear all your children who speak, who wail, who whisper in these languages this day. Those who find themselves in hospital beds or anxiously waiting beside them. Those who gather to say farewell to one who is traveling, one who is moving, and those who gather at gravesides. Those who worry about where the next meal or the next rent check will come from. Those who live in places where peace is just a word. May all those whose language is touched by pain hear you lamenting with them. God of Pentecost, God who speaks with many tongues, God who makes themselves known in many ways, fill us with your spirit this and every morning. Hear the prayers we share in all our different languages. We pray as people of the spirit who lights our fires, who fills our lungs with breath, and who blows us out into the world to live and serve. Amen. I invite you to sing our final song, All to Us. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation. Foundation, you are faithful. 
go throughout your week this week, pay attention to the Holy Spirit, bear witness, and pray, devote yourself to learning, being at the Lord's table, sharing in fellowship, and keep your eyes open May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.